I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. In this episode, I'm very pleased to have a double interview with Dan Pearson and Midori Shintani, the two key horticultural forces driving the Takachi Millennium Forest Project in Hokkaido, Japan, and co-authors of the book Takachi Millennium Forest, pioneering a new way of gardening with nature. I speak to Midori first, then Dan, about this vast 1,000-year project, their hopes and intentions for now and the future, and about their own places within the timeline of the forest. I began by asking Midori how big the site is and whether it's all gardened. Okay, uh, the whole site has a pioneering history and uh, size is 988 acres, which have been cultivated by humans since uh, 1898 when the first generation of pioneers arrived at this area of Togachi. So there's no primeval land at the Togachi Millennium Forest. And 670 acres is covered by the secondary forest. And the rest of the site is garden, farmland, meadow, and housing land, of course. And the land garden is about 50 acres. But the garden side has no boundary because the whole garden site is designed with the art of shake, you know, means borrowing view uh, by master plumbers, Dan Pearson and Tagalog landscape planning. With that in mind, how do you manage mm-hmm. it, a place so large with a team of three gardeners and occasional <laughs> students? <laughs> yeah, uh, luckily, my current team is formed by four full-time gardeners, including me. And one seasonal gardener, one seasonal lawn keeper. Uh, they are, this man is a specialist of lawn, you know. And uh, plus, we occasionally, yes, like you said, uh, we occasionally have one or two student gardeners and volunteer staff during the summer. And we also irregularly work with the people from a local forestry organization to maintain our forest site for some big work projects. And our Segway guide and the cafe staffs join our uh, garden work for early spring and autumn at the busiest, you know, the time of the season. Not not too Sorry. bad then. Yeah, not not too bad, but still small team. And I eagerly hope to have two more skilled, you know, the gardener and field keeper in my team, which is ideal number. Of people to keep the forest beautiful and make it better. Yeah. But yeah, on the other hand, I understand the reality that we have a dominant winter season for four months and we can open the garden for public for seven months. So small team with, uh, I can say, variable uh, working our system is essential. Yeah. So we, yeah, we lively work a lot during the growing season and we take a rest a lot during the snow season, just like our, you know, the plants do in the garden. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> you have to kind of yeah. pack it all into shorter seasons. Um, mm, yes, yes. So one of the things I was thinking when I was reading the book was how do you travel around a site that big? How do you, how do you get around? Oh, basically by foot, car, and truck, and rarely by horses with our friend horseman to access to the deepest forest site. Yeah. Horseback gardening is a novel one. I don't think many people do that here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, when we had a you know, serious uh, uh, natural disaster by typhoon attack 2016, actually, we couldn't access to any of the site, I mean, deeper, you know, the first, first site. So we couldn't, you know, the access by foot or car. So I asked uh, our friend Horseman to, yeah, let us uh, ride and horse and uh, to check that, how damaged we got that. So, and, you know, it's quite an unusual thing, but 
yeah, but also it's very functional and useful. So yes, yeah. horses is big, big help. Yeah, I think. Yeah. And the other thing that I was wondering, um, how do the horses, um, you know, well, when you're on horseback, obviously you're kind of probably a bit safer, but um, I was intrigued Uh to know what is a bear bell and why might they need one? (laughs) That's a very interesting question, Sarah. (laughs) Well, it is for people in the UK. I don't think we we have those hazards. (laughs) Of course, yeah. A bear bell is one of ideas not to encounter, you know, the, each other and obviously to protect ourselves from tragedy. You know, we can let, yeah, we can let the bear know humans at being there or coming closer by making a sound and give a bear time to be able to go away because they also don't want to encounter humans. So, yeah, I, I actually have the my bear bell. Oh. This is a sound. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> oh, and funny. so I would say if you don't have a bell, you just keep singing loudly, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we don't have anything like that over here for sure. <laughs> um, so when yeah. you mentioned, obviously, when the garden is in full winter, um, uh-huh. you, you don't kind of, the gardeners can't do very much work. Um so uh-huh. is the site still open to visitors during that time or is the whole thing closed down? Oh, uh, we are closed from uh, November to the end of April usually. And then uh, during those times we keep working outside for forestry and the shoveling snow goes, but we do mainly inside work at the greenhouse and the office. Oh, right. Yeah. So you can still work during that time. You just don't, don't venture mm. too far. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about the site is, as you said, it's not it's not completely primeval or it hasn't been since, well, centuries mm-hmm. ago. But if you just left the forest to evolve, would mm-hmm. that work? And does it need human intervention or would it kind of go back to a natural state? Oh, uh, I think if the land once was cultivated by human's hand... I believe that thoughtful human intervention is required. For example, we have several sites to nurture uh, endemic flora. I mean, nat- we call it native flora, but in the first floor by cutting vigorous sasa bamboo back and encouraging the seed bank of the other species. If nobody touches the site, we will soon lose the opportunity to meet those, you know, the various plants and study what kind of vegetation that land actually has. So, and also that this activity also is connected to see potential for our horticulture and its development. So, as long as we hope to create the landscape beautifully harmonized between wild nature and human life, yeah, we need to, yeah, yeah. put our hands into the land I think mm. yes and the sasa is invasive did that in originally mm-hmm. get imported into the site oh yeah originally yeah, yeah but it's original it's native it's not a bad you know the plant at all but it's just a very vigorous and invasive and it first for it can be a monoculture you know vegetation easily so we also, we of course, have a lot of, you know, the first floors only, I mean, monoculture of sasa bamboo because we don't cut the whole side back. So it's not a bad thing, but we, as long as we would like to see, the, you know, the rich vegetation. So mm. that's what we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, understand. Um, so what, roughly what percentage of the plants are endemic to that area that, that are on the site now? Well, particularly in the gardened uh, area. Okay. Um, we held the garden in a uh, uh, forest as well. So then in the forest, of course, 100% of the plants are endemic, including a naturalized species in the past. And uh, in, for example, in the meadow garden, ornamental perennial garden that done design, uh, that's about 10% is endemic. But Dan and I keep the planting mix developing all the time. So it possibly is going to be increased in the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's fun. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Did you need to be careful when you were introducing new species into the gardened areas that they weren't invasive? Uh, not serious, but we, 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 of course, we were afraid of that at the beginning, but um, until now, there is no problem. Mm-hmm. But it's, we, we must be careful, you know, the uh, native plant also that escaped from the forest into the garden, like, Sometimes it, it, it's going to be really, really successful. Like, um, for example, some of them and the naturally came into the garden and showed us fantastic combination with the perennials that we planted. So Dan and I decided to welcome them. It, they are native, but welcome them in the meadow garden. And yeah, so mm. yes, it happened to each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, what interested me as well is that in the forest uh-huh. areas, I think when yeah. Dan first came to the site, um, you know, uh-huh. the landscape was, was novel to him um, and he saw great beauty in all of the um, native plants. And I wondered uh-huh. if do visitors, particularly from Japan, do, they, do you feel uh-huh. that they appreciate the plants in the same way? Do they look at them with such fresh eyes as Dan did? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, in Japan there are uh, many enthusiasts who especially love endemic plants. So they tend to come to the Milan Forest on peak season of our, you know, endemic plants blooming in our spring. And a lot of uh, visitors, um, as all, you know, the plant lovers visitors, so they enjoy meeting both, you know, native or non-native plants. Yeah, that we invited it to make a garden. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I'm just thinking in the UK, if you presented a gar- you know, a, mm-hmm. a wild area, mm-hmm. um, yeah. I think a lot of people would be a bit blind to the plants that are there because they are so common. Um, and I'm mm-hmm. not sure you would get that wow factor, but obviously that works at the forest. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's, I think possibly, yeah. possibly, m- maybe more interesting plants, a more interesting set of native. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Obviously, you've got a very, very big site there that you're trying to plant. So, um, uh-huh. can you talk a bit about how you expand your stock of plants? Okay. Uh, we simply the collecting and sowing seeds and splitting and transplanting and thinning invasive to, you know, make ideal balance, especially in a native vegetation. And, uh, yeah. As I said, we are a small team, so I would like to save our time for one work as much as possible. Mm. So I often split, it sounds a bit, you know, strange, but so I often split it in a parent plant that I call in the forest floor by digging just a piece out from the whole plant and leaving the rest in the ground. So, and I don't need to dig the whole plant out from the ground. It actually works well. Less damages, less work, and the parent plant will quickly, you know, recovers. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, something That's like that. Really. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, obviously, you're open uh, not November to April, but the rest of the time. If people were thinking mm-hmm. of visiting from, particularly from overseas, um, is there a is there a best time to visit? Uh. It's a tough question. Yeah, I thought it would be. <laughs> it, but yeah, I think it depends on what you want to experience uh, in the garden at the Millennial Forest. If you'd like to witness you know, strength of plants and feel energy of them that's surviving a long, harsh winter, from the middle of May to the early June is the best season. And personally, meadow garden in September is my favorite. Full of seed heads, flowers, grasses, mingled with airy out colors, absolutely evoke your emotions. And I often recommend to come to visit us and grab your sentiment. Wow. Yeah. yeah, lovely. Um, and is it particularly hot at any time of the year? Oh, yes. Um, in May, you cannot believe this, but in May, we, every year we're going to have the hottest day, hottest temperature in Japan, actually. Wow. <laughs> huh. 
There are so many people don't know this, but yes, we record every year. We record Tokachi records the hottest temperature in May. Wow. One just just a, just a couple of days, but we record it. Yeah. Also, that uh, in the July and the August, hot, humid summer, but of course milder than mainland because the Hokkaido is a cooler, you know, the climate condition than a mainland. So, but yeah. If you if you'd like to travel around, you know, with a gentle weather, a climate condition, yeah, uh, June, the beginning of July, uh, September, October is really nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And how would you recommend taking more than one day to to visit? The definitely. Definitely, it's really nice to uh, travel around the Hokkaido. So also the, uh, in the Millennium Forest, I think one full day, uh, ideally, of course. But yeah, in Hokkaido, that we have a lot of you know dynamic landscape, and also that there's a lot of gardens, very unique, you know, the style. Mm. Each garden has unique style. So yes, more than one day, definitely. definitely. <laughs> mm. Um. So looking forward to the future of the project, obviously mm-hmm. it's such a long-term project. How are you training your successor or do you have a team of successors? Because obviously at the moment you have a lot of influence yeah. over the site, as does Dan, and I wondered how mm-hmm. moving forward you'll kind of ensure that continuity of vision. Right. Uh, yes, first of all, Yes, I am a training uh, successor or a team of a successor. And I'm not sure about the team of successor, but I hope some of them will be successful for the Millennium Forest in the future. And as the first generation of the Togachi Millennium Forest Garden team, and Dan and I have worked very hard to build up its foundation. And it is still carry on, but I also have been a caring about next generation since the very beginning because I the more you know the, I work in the Millennium Forest the more I have realized that my hands of every single day have a mission to surely pass you know the button to the next so yeah I do hope mm, one of you know uh, trainees or my gardeners going to be a successor for the Millennium Forest mm. And I actually not don't so seriously ensure continuity because the garden will be changed as new era when gardener's hand will be changed. And I think it must be the positively exciting and interesting part of the gardening. So design, uh, we uh, we could you know to take uh, over the drawings or of course in the plants themselves it can be the footprint of what we do so yeah yeah i feel right to become just a part of it with hopes i can say it is such a significant project what what does the garden mean to you um to me the garden is the most joyful and happiest place on earth because we cannot live without a plant and as one of the tiny little creatures surviving in the wild or not, the garden is my life itself and uh, the garden is a place that my soul comes from and returns. Thank you, Midori. Here's Dan describing the site and what the owner, Mr Hayashi, set out to achieve with it. The site sits on the very edge of an agricultural plain that was cleared uh, much earlier in the 1900s to make way for the growing of wheat and root vegetables and things which do very well in Hokkaido, which is the northernmost island in Japan. And the soil is deep and alluvial and it has really been what Hokkaido has made its living from that and forestry. So the land went up to the base of the mountain and then his land extends up into the mountain into forests, which has been felled once or possibly twice 
with the main oak removed at the uh, in the early 1900s and then regenerated again and then another round of oak removed and then often in places pulp newspaper pulp um larch replaced so that really it starts to become forestry rather than natural forest and what he wanted to do was to really address this imbalance that we have imposed on the land by taking away the forest and, and changing the conditions and looking at a way in which he could preserve this piece of land, which was about 400 hectares by the time he'd completed buying the various parcels. So flat land running up into mountain, um, the very highest parts of the land being inaccessible and showing us that there were places where there was still natural forest, where the lumber had not been extracted. When I was reading the book, it really struck me, I think, that water has shaped the design and the planting on the site. Is that, tr- is that true to say? There are fast moving streams which come out of the, and down from the mountains and they kind of bisect the site and weave their way through the woods. So there's an ever present movement of water and you can even hear it in the winter because it's sort of gurgling underneath the snow cover and the water is never a problem we've never watered once um, in the gardens that we've made there because the climate is damp Um, there are mountain mists that comes down come down and summer rains and we're now finding as the climate's changing that there is now a july monsoon period um, Midori, the head gardener there, calls it a monsoon. It's not strictly speaking a monsoon, but it's definitely a summer wet period. And it's been something that we've very much had to incorporate in the way that everything has been approached. So there are bridges that go backwards and forwards over the streams so that you can use them really as places of focus and they help to animate the landscape and provide this constant interest. But when there was a big typhoon, for instance, in 2016, the streams swelled and they swept away all the bridges and brought down huge boulders from the mountain. Um, And at that point, you could see that this is a wild and raw landscape. You're very near and close to Russia on that border up there. And... It's a landscape which kicks back big time and makes us realise that we're really very small. So there was considerable damage from that typhoon. But miraculously, nature is such a powerful thing that it's repaired itself. And the gardeners there have managed to repair the land that we've been tending. Um, and it's it's back on track again, though definitely something that was very humbling when it happened. Mm, yeah, I can imagine. I was quite intrigued by the notion, um, obviously Japanese gardening, I think we associate it with the ornamental and to a degree formal, not not maybe in the way that we kind of understand it in English gardens, but certainly there's a formality incorporated. Um, and when you designed the and planned the forest, you obviously brought in a lot of a, a naturalistic ethos. And I wondered if since the forest has been in situ, do you think it's had a knock-on effect the way that people garden in Japan, has it opened up that kind of naturalistic aesthetic to a wider audience over there? I think there's always been an interest in nature, um, but there's a big divide between the interpretation of nature and naturalism, I think. But because the gardens are, Japanese gardens are often emulating nature and stylizing it, um, it wasn't such an enormous leap in a way to get people to look at nature again through a naturalistic approach to the planting. There had already been a bit of a cottage garden, Western style craze, which of course had introduced the idea of informality, but I think linking it much more closely to nature and the, and nature being the inspiration rather than a kind of model of English cottage gardeners. I think it um, it touched a, a note with people, and I think that the gardeners really shown people that there 
is potential in a different way of tending plants and looking to nature as the inspiration. There's this wonderful discipline there called Satoyama, which is about only taking what you need out of the landscape to live closely alongside it. And of course, this was from when there wasn't so much pressure on landscape, when there were people living in more harmony with the land. Um, but there is still residue of people going out to forage for mountain vegetables and things and that appreciation of plants growing in the natural environment. So what we really did was to key into aspects of that approach of living closely with nature through Satoyama and made sure that the garden had a feeling of that old culture in the way that we were tending the plants. Because it's it's a very important site, and I think probably a site of that size and that importance does need some form of community involvement and buy-in. Um, and I wondered how much that had happened as part of the process of the design and indeed going forward with the site. Well, interestingly, Satoyama wasn't part of the Hokkaido landscape. Hokkaido was only settled in the late 1800s. Um, it was previously a land that was occupied by a tribe called the Ainu, an Inuit tribe called the Ainu. So our modern culture there really has not taken with it some of those old ways. Um, so what Midori, the head gardener there, is doing is really reintroducing those old ways of tending the land back into the landscape again. And she has to be very careful with um, who's actually working in the garden because it's very carefully managed. You know, it's a very small team that's there. So she doesn't have a volunteer scheme, but she does have local people who come to help and work. So she has um, uh, a team of women who have retired from work, for instance, who come in and uh, work uh, for her as uh, as we do. So there are these fleets of, of, of women who come in and um, and help at certain times of year, you know, which is really fantastic. And then um, she has uh, students who come from overseas. So every year there are two, perhaps three students who come and work within the gardens as well, but very much under her tutorship so that the ways that are being uh, learned have been communicated really clearly and thoroughly. It's a very small team and as soon as you get volunteers involved, you need to have a special and dedicated amount of time uh, to look after those people. Um, and she's found a way of making it work so that she does have the inclusion of people who are um, not just staff. Yeah, I was asking her about that actually this morning when I spoke to her and it is an interesting concept and I think it's one that we wrestle with with a lot of our um, historic gardens. You know, what happens if a garden is so kind of linked to the people who have developed it, planned it, designed it, worked in it, what then happens when, say, that person is no longer there? You know, how how does that process of panning the reins over work, especially with a garden that it has got such a huge kind of future ahead of it. Um, and it is a, a very interesting question. And it's one, I guess, that maybe you wrestled with from the start. Well, you know, a, a garden is um, a garden is the gardener in a way. You know, it's a, it's a truism. Um, and we would not be able to do what we're doing in the garden, parts of the garden, without Midori. You know, she's an absolutely vital link. Um, she's a brilliant gardener. She's a really good communicator. She understands the whole ethos, you know, which is really not the Japanese way. So she's bringing in the Japanese way to something which is much more, um, Western style in a way and developing this very interesting hybrid. Um, and what we hope, of course, is that through doing something like the book that we can communicate um, how things are done at the Millennium Forest and, and why it's important and get people's buy-in to how to nurture and look after that place. And hopefully that will take us into the future um, with some sort of security in a way in terms of that custodianship. Talking about it being a, a, you know maybe a slight hybrid between different cultures, 
could you see a similar garden existing like that anywhere else in the world? Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, what's brilliant about this idea, Mr. Hayashi's original idea that the garden is sustainable for a thousand years is it really gets you to think about what does that actually mean? Because, of course, we can't guarantee any of that. Um, but what we can attempt to do is to engender a, a love of a place through caring for it, for it and, uh, and tending it so that it does have some future um, built into it through the the buy-in of people through their, their passion for it as it develops. Hmm. And how do you see the site evolving with climate change? It's really difficult to say. You know, since I've been going over the last 20 years, we've already seen a difference. The snows are coming in slightly later. They're usually, they're there now, actually, at the, um, often at the beginning of November. But if the frost comes in before the snow, it goes down to minus 25 in the middle of the winter. If the frost is already in the ground, um, the plants that we've planted, which are actually protected by the eider down and snow, are much more vulnerable if they go into winter with frost in the ground underneath the snow blanket. So we're starting to see that snow cover changing. We're starting to see a different pattern of wet weather in the summer. So it does feel like it's it's accelerating. It feels like it's very fast. And of course, there have always been weather pattern changes. But we just can't assume that we're looking at a stable future on that front. And as gardeners and people who are nurturing this landscape, we can only do it um, in the time that we've got to do it. So that we hope that what this place has become in terms of people's uh, love for it and engagement with it will be the thing that takes it into the future. And whatever the climate does, we will have to adapt to. This isn't meant to be a flippant question, but obviously when you design a garden or you work in a garden, you put a maintenance plan in place and you put plans in place for the future. Is there a plan that sees it through a thousand years in the future? You know, how far ahead do you plan with a garden like this? I think we're probably planning, we're planning 30 to 50 years. Um, and the blueprint uh, is something that could be picked up in 30 years time and then given another 30 to 50 years. So we've put a blueprint in place, which is robust as a concept and an idea. And of course, each generation that comes on board to look after this, you know, Midori's replacement eventually, and you know, somebody who might be my equivalent eventually, you know, if the idea is strong enough in the first place, that's the thing that will be robust. So we can't possibly plan for that far into the future. Um, so this is a, a an aspiration. Um, it's an idea about getting people to engage with land so that they understand it and care for it and nurture it and see it as being something that is fragile and needs to be looked after with care and not simply just taken from. This is a, a bit of a flight of fancy, I suppose, but if you could time travel forwards a thousand years, where would it be? Where would you want it to be? I, I don't... I don't, this isn't meant to sound kind of um, too doom and gloom, but I, I don't know, I don't know how much of a presence we will have in a thousand years. I've just got no idea. It feels to me that regardless of the human presence on this planet, that nature will find a way of adapting. It's much stronger than we are. And I'm guessing in, the, in a way that we're going to have to learn to live with it and what it's starting to throw at us in terms of big changes. Otherwise, we're simply not going to be able to work with it. So it would be fascinating to see what happens. I think that right now we need to be humbled by what's happening with the climate change and really listening. Otherwise, we are going to be thrown off. Hmm. Yeah, that's the... The completely unique thing about this space is that it does put you in context in in time and it makes you think 
big, big scale rather than just, you know, what what's coming up next year. It's it's a completely different perspective and outlook on a garden. Um, and that's what makes it brilliant. Um, has it exceeded everyone's expectations, do you think? I think it's a place when you, if you go there, there's something very powerful about the place anyway. It sits at a particular point in the mountains and the way the light falls on it. And I think sometimes certain places just have a much higher resonance and it's somewhere that is always going to be special. Um, and I think that because we've been allowed to apply quite careful energy to this place and um, fine tune it, it's really shown everybody that there are extraordinary things that can be done, even if they're sometimes very light of touch when you strike a balance with a piece of landscape. So I think that in some ways it really has shown people that the lightness of touch, the very fact that they've got such a small number of people looking after this place and yet there's this much magic and this much message that comes out of it. I think that slowly people are beginning to see that it's really got something. I think maybe it's important because it's not just completely wild. It is the fact that it's cultivated to a degree that that draws people in and kind of opens starts that relationship with wilder spaces. Is, do you see do you see it as that as having that effect? Well, I think the you know as a landscape designer, one of the things that um, I wanted to do there was to um, make some places that felt familiar um, or safe because they had been tended and nurtured and I think one of the things that you know we were finding when I first went out there in 2000 was that people were intimidated by the forest because it was big and wild and rough and there were bears in the forest and unknowns you know and by making ways into it that allowed you to feel part of it i.e just the simple decking walkways we've got through the first parts of the woods and the bridges so over the streams, it, it makes it feel managed. It makes it feel like a safe place. And by creating a number of places where you can see that care applied, I think it allows people to see things in a way that's non-threatening. And when your defences are down, you start to see things in a much deeper way, I think, often. And it becomes a fuller experience for that, for that feeling of feeling comfortable in the place and able to look at it without feeling overwhelmed by the scale or the roughness of it or or the fact that you have these such dramatic seasonal changes. It becomes somewhere that you can enter and be part of um, instead of for, instead of feeling fearful. I, I get the connection that you and Midori feel it, it feels almost spiritual to the place mm. um and I asked this question of Midori what does the garden actually mean to you I think it's um for me it's it's an, it's an extraordinary opportunity really to engage with this idea of things in a very long-term way and to see what I do as a landscape designer as being as much about conservation um, as it is about providing a place for people that, as you say, is a spiritual connection with nature. So in a way, it's allowed me to go really quite deeply into what makes that place tick and, and how can the best things of it be revealed. So it's something that's evolved over a long time. And as you get to know something over a long time, your relationship with with it becomes much deeper so I feel very connected and it's one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book really to honour the place and to allow people who wouldn't have the opportunity of getting that far to see it to be able to feel part of it and feel some of that potency and and the message that it has behind it to look after landscape to see it as being something that's is finite and um, and should be treasured. My thanks to Dan and Midori for speaking about the Takachi Millennium Forest Project and for talking openly about their personal connections to the site 
and the special place it occupies in the landscape and in time. If you want to see how humans can be utterly immersed in and inseparable from a landscape, then I wholeheartedly recommend reading the book. Thanks to you for listening, and I'll leave you with Dr Ian Bedford, talking about a visitor you might find on your ivy when it starts to flower. Throughout the year, Hedera helix, the common ivy, which is our only native evergreen vine, plays an important role within the environment, providing shelter and a stable habitat for numerous different species of Britain's wildlife. But then throughout autumn, the ivy blooms and becomes one of the most significant food sources for many end-of-season pollinators that are busy preparing themselves for the winter ahead. Attracted to the plant's yellowy-green floral clusters by their pungent perfume, the generalist feeding wasps, bees, flies, beetles and even late-season butterflies will often transform the normally serene appearance of an ivy into a frenzied hive of activity as the insects compete for the flower's freshly produced nectar. And in the midst of this melee, particularly within southern England, it's becoming increasingly more common for us to find a colourful non-native bee called the ivy mining bee. First recorded in 2001, these invasive solitary bees, with their orange and black striped bodies and fluffy ginger thorax, hatch from their pupae within underground chambers to coincide with the ivy's flowering period. The males always emerge first and wait for the females. Then, as they appear, the males frantically compete with each other to mate, often becoming entangled together in a chaotic mass around the female on the ground. Eventually, a male will succeed before the female leaves for the ivy flowers. She'll then feed for a while on the nectar, restoring her energy before searching to find a slope of bare earth or sand where she can excavate a tunnel, usually alongside many other females that will be doing the same. When completed, she'll return to the ivy to collect pollen that she takes back to her tunnel, leaving it inside with a newly laid egg. She'll then repeat this over a few weeks until the tunnel is full of little chambers each containing ivy pollen and an egg. The bees will then die before winter, leaving their eggs to hatch into tiny grubs that feed on the pollen and develop alone into the next generation of ivy mining bees that will once again emerge the following autumn, just in time for the ivy flowers. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk follow me on twitter roots and all facebook roots and all uk and instagram roots and all pod but please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.